happened right at the beginning of this chapter. That there was this idea that, that we had been given a new world, a place to start over um, and do better than they had done in Europe. <laughs> well, if it's a new world, let's make it perfect. And we don't only need new everything else. We need not just a new government, a new philosophy, a new art, a new literature. We need new religions for the new world, uh, some people believed. George Ripley's Brook Farm, founded in 1841 in Massachusetts, uh, was, a, was one of many utopian societies uh, where they thought they could craft society from scratch to make it so that everybody was happy. Work, leisure, and, uh, uh, and, and the produce, whatever they made, were to be divided equally. Residents would try, uh, strive to fulfill themselves, to do what they believed in, this transcendentalist idea that we all have our own individual destiny and our own individual idea of what our life should be like, and we should pursue that. Again, standard stuff in, in uh, uh, every movie that you see today. In 1841, the main building burned down at Brook Farm, and everybody laughed. It was simply too expensive to rebuild, uh, and, and the whole place falls apart. Nathaniel Hawthorne had been there, uh, the great author Hawthorne, and he left very bitter. Um, he would write about people cut off from society and the, the evil of pursuing what he called egotism. So he would go there wanting to find this fulfillment, uh, but he will come away feeling that it is just really an exercise in selfishness and, and, and it was a disaster. And he actually becomes one of the early important critique, uh, uh, critics of romanticism and transcendentalism. Um, uh, he writes a book about his experience at Brook Farm, but more famously uh, uh, for you high school students, he writes The Scarlet Letter in 1850. Um, uh, which is, again, if you think about the Scarlet Letter, somebody follows their heart, like the Transcendentalists tell you to do, and it turns out to be a disaster. So even that book is a critique of Transcendentalism. In 1825, um, Robert Owen will found a utopian community in Indiana called New Harmony, and here they'll practice total equality between men and women, and every, so everybody on there is totally equal. It was a financial disaster, but it inspired many others. Many utopian communities were concerned with gender roles. There was a great idea that women were being uh, mistreated, and of course, as always in society, there was an obsession with sex. Uh, that's not new. In 1848, the Oneida community was founded in, new, in uh, upstate New York uh, by John Humphrey Noyes. In, in, in the Oneida community, everyone was married to everyone. Now, this does not mean that it was a big uh, uh, free love fest or anything like that. Um, but... There, there was not monogamy. That was not practiced. Women were freed from male lust and attachment to raising children because the children were always raised communally. Sex and pregnancy were closely monitored. Um, and the way they set this up, and you're going to love this, is that they decided that the young girls needed experienced lovers, and they needed people who would be careful not to impregnate them, so people they know what, knew what they were doing. And so they would have the younger girls have sex with the older men. Now, you want to guess who came up with that plan? If you guess the older men, you're absolutely right. And don't worry, because the older women got to have sex with the younger men uh, so they could teach them what to do. So basically, this, the, the way they established the, the sex roles in this community um, was simply to say that the older people got to sleep with the younger people, um, which uh, I, I can imagine was very popular with the older people. Uh, one of my favorite uh, facts about Oneida is that uh, the future presidential assassin, Charles Gateau, went to Oneida, joined the community, became part of this giant group marriage, and still could not get anybody to sleep with him, um, and left in frustration because apparently he went there uh, for the sex and uh, still couldn't get any. Um, maybe that's what's going to make him so frustrated that he ends up shooting a president later. Oneida, by the way, still uh, famous today for its silverware. It became one of the leading manufacturers of silverware in the world. That's how they paid for all this. Uh, and you can still today buy Oneida silverware, although it's not uh, from this uh, giant uh, mass uh, marriage cult. The Shakers. The Shakers are another group founded by Mother Ann Lee, who take an approach towards uh, gender roles and, and sex that you'll probably find interesting. It's actually begun in the 1770s. And uh, by the time we get into this 1820s, 1840s period that we're talking about here, there are more than 20 communities um, up in the north. They're called the Shakers because they dance in their ceremonies to shake themselves free of sin. They believed in sexual equality, but the men and women are kept apart. They, they are completely celibate. So you go join the Shaker community and you are swearing off sex. This is a reaction to rapid change, the whole community. It was extremely conservative. Um, and, and these are people who are rejecting industrialization and modernization. 
as you can imagine, it didn't grow very quickly because if nobody's having sex, um, there's really no growth in your community. And so they had to recruit new members. And usually what would happen is older people who had kind of gotten into that point in their life where that really wasn't a major concern for them might retire into a Shaker community. A group that I don't think is in your book, but I just love so much, the Millerites. Miller is a New Yorker who predicts that the world is going to end and Jesus is going to return um, on uh, uh, March 21st of 1844. This becomes a major movement. People sell everything they own. They begin preparing for the end of the world. You see this guy has built a little device here, the salamander safe, to survive the end of the world. Thousands and thousands of people come to believe that Miller's calculations about the end of the world are in fact correct. And when the day comes, nothing happens. Miller says, oh, I made a little minor error. And uh, uh, he says, it's going to come a month later. Now it's going to be April 18th of, of 1844. And when that day comes, he says, oh, well, well, oops, I messed up again. He only loses about half his followers, by the way, as he keeps inaccurately predicting the end of the world. And on uh, uh, October 22nd, 1844, his third attempt to predict the end of the world will be called the Great Disappointment, as his followers will become so convinced that he can't be wrong three times that they will uh, gather in mass on hilltops and stuff waiting for Jesus to come save them. Um, but it doesn't happen. He keeps predicting the end of the world, uh, although he, he um, uh, uh, has fewer and fewer followers as he goes along. But as Heidi had millions of people believing this, uh, in 1849, the end of the world does come for, for Miller anyway as he dies. But today, there are more than 17 million people who are called Adventists uh, who begin um, as uh, th that religion actually begins from the followers of, of Miller. And the advent they're talking about is the advent of the end of the world of Jesus returning. Uh, so I enjoy uh, uh, discussing uh, Miller and, and the Millerites.